Good morning, everyone. I have the late show today, so I'm really appreciative of that. Uh, anyway, uh, welcome to today's presentation. Uh, for one or two, I'll tell you, my name's Don Campbell. That differentiates me from the guy that looks like Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Sometime you have to ask him about that or ask me about it. We had a good time in Turkey last year, and uh, uh, he ended up on Facebook as a Hulk Hogan lookalike. Anyway, uh, I'm going to talk today about New Zealand not just New Zealand, but we're going to begin with the natural history of the islands, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how they were shaped by the movements of the earth. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the flora and the fauna, which is uh, in great variety here, and you may see some of it or some, maybe all of it if you really work at it. And then we're going to virtually visit the Maori natives and uh, some of the very early explorers of the region. And finally, we'll talk specifically in, in kind of a little bit of detail about each of the ports Picton, Napier, Taronga, and Auckland. New Zealand is made up of two main islands. Surprisingly, they're named the North Island and the South Island, uh, and a lot of smaller ones as well. And it's situated across the Tasman Sea. If, for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, that's where we are right now. Uh, some about 1,500 kilometers or 900 miles east of Australia. Uh, New Zealand was the last major landmass to be discovered. About 250 million years ago, or maybe a little earlier than that, New Zealand was part of the supercontinent Gondwana land. Uh, the Australia-New Zealand portion of Gondwana split apart from the rest of that continent about 90 million years ago. When New Zealand separated from Australia, the Tasman Sea itself was, was created. Uh, the seafloor and Australia's mainland actually locked together to form the Australian tectonic plate. Geologically, however, New Zealand is the youngest country or the youngest landmass on Earth. Today, New Zealand and New Caledonia are usually referred to, by geologists anyway, as Zealandia. They kind of look at it as mostly a sunken continent uh, that lies between the Pacific and the Australian plates. At the North Island, New Zealand, the Pacific plate is being pushed under the Australian plate. The Pacific plate is moving westward at a little over an inch and a half a year. To put that into context, that's about as fast as your fingernails grow. So if you sit there and watch your fingernails for a year, it'll move about that far. Anyway, on the other hand, the South Island, the plates are sliding past each other. And that's formed what's called the Alpine Fault Zone and the Southern Alps. Movement along that plate boundary has played a role in the recent devastating earthquakes down in Christchurch on South Island. City of Auckland sits on an area that has about 50 volcanoes. They're considered extinct, but trust me, the volcanic field is just dormant. <laughs> Evidence of tectonic plate movement and the associated fault lines are most readily seen in the form of all of those volcanoes around Auckland. Some eruptions have formed high volcanoes, such as North Island's Mount Taranaki, and some produce lava flows that just are similar to the Auckland volcanic field. They just float out. Others contain, <coughs> excuse me, large amounts of water, and they caused really violent eruptions that were driven by the steam that came out of them. And those eruptions, when the volcano caved back in, created calderas or lakes. Now, Australia has at least 14, Auckland has at least 14 of these large lava tube caves that run underneath it from the volcano down to the sea. Uh, lava tubes basically form when the outer layer of lava starts to cool and the hot lava stops to flow and it just kind of drizzles out and leaves these big cave formations. Uh, the positive result of volcanic activity from all of this stuff though is very fertile soil and with a myrtle, um, myrtle climate, a mild climate, the land here is mostly covered by fairly dense forest. 80% of the trees, ferns, and flowering plants are endemic or native to the islands. Limestone caves, this is what Andy asked about the other night, by the way. Limestone caves formed about 30 million years ago when the region was still under the sea. When the limestone started to crack, massive cave systems were created, and New Zealand is best known for large numbers of glowworms, and they're found in some of these caves. 
Now, this particular species is found only in New Zealand. It spends most of its life in larval form that could last from six to 12 months. That's like a big worm, by the way. Uh, they spin a silk nest that they hang down from the ceiling with these long threads. And using bioluminescence, they attract other insects and bugs and spiders and stuff like that. And they use these things to capture those insects, that food. They reel it back up into the, into the larva, and then they basically eat whatever bug they caught. Surprisingly enough, some of the adult flies that are the parents of these things will fly through these caves and get caught in those same wires to be consumed by their offspring. I guess that might be payback or something, I don't know. <clears throat> the largest tree in New Zealand is the karai. Now, near Taranga, there's a karai tree. It's one of the largest on Earth, and it's nearly 167 feet high and maybe 2,000 years old. Uh, the tree was named by a Maori, or for the Maori god of the forest, and all the woodland creatures in their mythology are believed to be its children. They're cone-bearing trees, and they prefer the very top part of ridge lines on the hills that dominate the Northland forest. Now, there are many uses of karai gum and, or pitch. You know, that's the sap that comes out of the tree. Uh, being flammable, it was used early on as a fire starter, and they also put it in a, bound it up in flax and used it as a torch. They also burned it. The natives burned it, and they mixed it with animal fat. And then that gum became a very dark pigment that they used for tattoos. I just can't picture taking burnt sap and fat and sticking it in my body, but nonetheless, I guess it worked. As with other amber-like materials, it sometimes has insects and little plant parts in it. Uh, it was Auckland's main export in the 19th century, and that was the thing that caused the early growth of the city. From the forest of the far north to the southern Alps of New Zealand, there are a lot of fascinating plants and trees here to look for. The yellow flowers of the kawai tree are beautiful. They're really kind of spectacular and they're very vibrant. Now, in early times, the Maori used this tree for medicine. Its bark was heated and made into kind of a poultice, and then they would use that to treat wounds or rub on a sore back, or they made it into an infusion to treat bruises and muscle pain. But I have to warn you, if you go out in the woods and you pick this stuff, parts of this tree are poisonous. So don't nibble on the flowers. Time magazine reported that New Zealand is a storehouse for discontinued zoologic, zoological models. Because of its isolation, native animals and birds are pretty unusual. And here you can find some of the most fascinating direct descendants of prehistoric creatures. Moa birds uh, were very tall. They reached heights of about mm, nine feet. Uh, they were the only wingless birds. They didn't even have prehistoric kind of wing stubs. They had no sign of any of that. They're the only ones that are known to have ever have existed. As they evolved, their wings became unnecessary because there were no natural predator predators here. Now, many of these birds became extinct after the humans arrived and introduced, among other things, mammals. Also, the Maori hunted the birds, and, that, and they also cleared the land. They wanted to have more room for them to live, and that led to the disappearance not only of the moa, but also 30 other species of birds. New Zealand's national symbol is this cute little nocturnal flightless bird known as the kiwi. It has nostrils way out on the end of its beak. Now, they look pretty cute, but they're really pretty fierce, and they're highly territorial. Uh, it's endangered and quite rare in the wild. You probably, if you spend a lot of time in New Zealand, would never see one of these in the wild. Uh, but there are a number of kiwi houses in the various zoos and wildlife parks around the country. And interestingly enough, when you go into the house where these birds are, it's dark because they're a nocturnal bird. Several other native species were flightless, including the kakapu parrot. Because of introduced predators, the kakapu was nearly wiped out and today only some 131 of them are known to exist. It's a large, again, a nocturnal bird. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, living par uh, parrots or birds in the world. It has also one of the longest lives. It's the world's only flightless parrot and the heaviest. I guess it spends some time uh, in the dining room in the evening. Anyway, you can see him uh, hanging out almost every night up on deck nine at the Terrace Cafe. 
The Takahe is also flightless, and it was thought to be extinct back in 1898, but was rediscovered in 1948. It's about 25 inches long and weighs over six pounds. That's probably why it couldn't get off the ground when it tried to fly. Anyway, it's a noisy bird and has a call that's somewhat like, most of you probably remember the old chalkboard and you know the blackboard with the chalk. Well, it's kind of like dragging your fingernails across one of those chalkboards. It's a real screechy, awful kind of sound. The earliest known human inhabitants in New Zealand are the Maori. They date back to about the 12th century. The Maori reached Taranga uh, following a very long chain of island hopping voyages that began over in Southeast Asia and then they went out through Polynesia. Now the Maori were hunters, fishers, and gatherers and farmers. Their oral history tells the ancestors arrived from Polynesia on large ocean-going canoes. Here in New Zealand, they adapted to a much colder and harsher climate. And that was particularly true when they went down to South Island. Maori means natural or ordinary. It distinguishes mortals from deities and spirits. And the Maori used the term the people of the land to kind of describe themselves. And that emphasizes their relationship with the earth itself. Their society follows many Polynesian customs and beliefs. And over the centuries, though, the New Zealand Maoris developed a very unique language, some mythology that was all their own crafts and performing arts. This is a Maori chief sketch that was made back in 1784. The Maori marked their skin with tattoo, with extensive, what was called temoko, or tattooing. Uh, in the early Maori culture, high-ranking people had moko. Uh, those without moko were considered to be of lower status. Now, moko marked the passage to adulthood of the elite youth and was accompanied by various rites and rituals. Maori lived primarily along the coast, but they did erect some temporary camps pretty far inland. Artifacts at those camps included things like bone necklaces, uh, stone tools, and the remains of small shelters have been found. Uh, ancient midden or trash heaps uh, showed a diet that included birds, fish, and shellfish. And of course, the moa bird was their main food supply. Older human skeletons revealed a very hard life by these people. They had healed broken bones that indicated they had a balanced diet, a pretty supportive community, and that they cared for their injured. The Maori used ancient Polynesian burial rituals. Uh, basically, they would bury the body, and then after it had been in the ground for a while, the skulls were removed, and those were replaced by rings made from shells, and then the skulls were reburied later on. Now, this is a photograph of a war canoe, and it's in a small village of Watangi uh, on the Bay of Islands. And the Maori lived in villages that were made up of several extended families. There were three classes of people in their society. There were chiefs and ruling families, there were commoners, and there were slaves. Now, elaborate carved meeting houses, like this one at Waitangi, uh, were built along with hill fortifications and some of the largest canoes that were ever constructed. The local flax plant uh, replaced coconut palms and hibiscus for making mats and fishing nets and clothing and so on. But climate change, earthquakes, tsunamis, and the extinction of their food species started to lead to pretty severe uh, social upheaval. Tribes became warlike and eventually even turned to cannibalism. Now, don't let that scare you when a Maori wants to come up and give you a traditional Maori greeting. The way it works is they want to touch their forehead to your forehead and then push their nose against your nose. Don't be afraid when he takes out his, no, they won't take out a knife. They're very, very happy people. Cannibalism was gone by the time the first known English or European explorer reached New Zealand and that was Abel Tasman in 1642. He was a Dutch seafarer, explorer, and merchant, was sent to explore and map the lands down under. He didn't, <laughs> things amazing, he didn't find Australia, the biggest of all of it, but he did discover Tasmania and he named that Van Diemen's Land. Now, Terry's gonna talk more about that in a couple of days, I guess. Uh, and then he found New Zealand. Tasmania had one hostile encounter when four of his crew were killed by the Maori. And at least one Maori was hit by a canister shot from one of his ship's cannons. 
Now, the Europeans didn't return for about 125 years, so obviously there wasn't a whole lot of interest left behind by uh, Tasman. Uh, and that's when the British explorer, uh, a guy that we may have heard of called James Cook, mapped nearly all of New Zealand's coastline. Cook gave the Bay of Plenty its modern name when he anchored there uh, during his round the world voyage. Actually, he, as you know, he had more than one voyage, so he came here quite a few times. Now, the European and North American whaling, sealing, and trading ships soon started to arrive on the islands, and they traded flax, potatoes, fruit, and pigs for muskets. Now, pretty soon, all the local northern tribes were armed. This is a drawing that depicts a pa, and that's a fortified hilltop, and you can see them playing trumpets and conch shells. Uh, they were being blown, and the weapons were being yielded. Anyway, it was the beginning of the musket wars in 1807. The Civil War lasted for 35 years. Uh, the Maori used their new knowledge and technology, including firearms, against each other. In almost 500 battles during that time, several tribes were decimated and more than 40,000 of the Maori were killed. To add to their plight, European diseases killed many more of the natives. Measles, typhoid, scarlet fever, and whooping cough were the most prevalent, and they devastated the natives. Epidemics spread across North Island and even onto South Island. The Maori encountered sealers and whalers and even some crewed on those ships. In 1809, the natives captured and slaughtered 66 crew and passengers of the sailing vessel Boyd. And that was in revenge because the captain had beat a Maori chieftain's son. Escaped Australian convicts, deserters from ships and missionaries exposed the Maori to more outside influences. The first European settlers were pretty much transient traders, but others brought, bought land from the local chiefs and started to settle in. Pretty soon there were about 2,000 Europeans or people of direct European descent in New Zealand. Some married Maori women and built permanent settlements. Those who went native were known as the white Maori. Great Britain assigned Captain William Hobson as Lieutenant Governor of New Zealand. The Colonial Mission House at the Bay of Islands is where the treaty was signed by him and 43 North Island chieftains. During the next eight months, over 500 more Maori chiefs signed it as it was taken all around the country. Tension led to conflict in the 1860s and the colonial co uh, government confiscated the Maori land. Those land losses took their toll on the native economy and the social structure of many of the tribes. The two groups remained socially, culturally, and economically separate. That's the Europeans and the Maori. Many Maori started to migrate into the larger towns and cities looking for work. By the 20th century, white settlers had overwhelmingly outnumbered the Maori. Now, it might have been just some tension between the Europeans and the Maori that was caused by the British that didn't really understand the Maori culture. Now, haka is an ancestral war cry, dance, or a challenge of the Maori. It has vigorous movements and the stomping of feet that's performed by the group. In addition, they shout, and they stick their tongue out, and they bug their eyes real wide open. And it is pretty impressive. Uh, it's not just a war dance that's performed by men. They also use it for the All Blacks, the New Zealand uh, rugby team that's had some success, and I think they kind of intimidate their opponents with the haka, but that's also performed by women and sometimes mixed groups and by children as a way to welcome people to their towns. In 1975, a tribunal was established in New Zealand, uh, and that was to honor the treaty that was signed 100 years earlier. Compensation with money and land was granted to the Maori people. Large settlements of, of money and land were paid out by the government, and much of it was invested to provide educational and health services to the natives. Now let's take a quick look at our ports of call, and we'll start with Picton. Now this is, it's in the Marlborough region. It's close to the head of Queen Charlotte Sound on South Island. It's going to be our only port on South Island. Picton has a population of less than 3,000 people. It is not a metropolis, folks. 
but the port has several cafes, restaurants, and art galleries that are very close to the pier facility. The Marlborough region is New Zealand's largest wine growing area and home to some of the world's most renowned Sauvignon Blanc. There are over 40 wineries in Marlborough and nearby is Blenheim. It's the most populous town with a population of just over 30,000. It enjoys one of New Zealand's sunniest climates and has hot, relatively dry summers and cool winters. We're going to get there kind of in between the two, what would be called fall or autumn. One of the most interesting things in Picton itself is the Edwin Fox Maritime Museum. Again, being in a Coast Guard, you have to realize I'm going to put something in here about maritime. Anyway, the ship Edwin Fox spent many years of her career in service to the British government as a troop transport during the Crimean War. Now, during that war, it's reported that this ship, one of her passengers on this ship was Florence Nightingale. Now, in 1858, the ship, oh, not Florence, by the way, was chartered by the British government to transport convicts to Western Australia. The Edwin Fox is believed to be the only surviving hull, intact hull of a ship that was known to have carried convicts. Later, she sailed between England and the Far East as a trade ship. Across the Picton region, there's a wide range of leisure activities. You can swim with dolphins, go whale watching, you can walk through the bush or along the rugged coastline you can go on scenic boat cruising, fishing, water skiing, and kayaking. And of course, there's always the wineries. For those of you who are aviation enthusiasts, there's the Aviation Heritage Center. It's just two miles outside of Picton, and it features the Knights of the Sky exhibition. That's a collection of World War I aircraft and artifacts. And among the planes on display is a Sopwith Camel. For those of you who remember Charles Schultz and the Charlie Brown thing, that's what Snoopy flew. <laughs> Not that one, however. Our next port of call will be at Napier in Hawke's Bay. Now, Napier has a population of just over 61,000, so it's quite a bit bigger than Picton, uh, but it's also not a very super large city. It's located on North Island, also recognized because of its world-class wines. Today, Napier is connected to one of the largest wool centers in the Southern Hemisphere, and vast quantities of wool, frozen meat, and wood pulp and timber are exported through the port every year. There's a statue in the town of Pania, and it's located near the center of the town along the shore of the Marine Parade. That's kind of a walkway that goes right along the coastline. It was unveiled back in 1954, and the story of it goes a little bit like this. Pania was a beautiful maiden who swam about with the creatures of the reef during the day. After sunset, she would rest among the flax bushes near Napier. Karatoki uh, was the handsome son of a Maori chieftain who went to the stream every evening to get a drink of water. He wasn't aware that she was watching him until one night when she cast a spell over her, over him. He had never seen someone so beautiful and instantly was smitten with love. She also fell in love and they were secretly married. She explained that when the sirens of the sea called her each morning, she would not survive if she did not go to them. She promised to return every evening and their marriage continued on that basis. A wise elder told Karatoki that Panaya would not be allowed to return to the sea if she swallowed cooked food. So one night as she slept, Karatoki took some cooked food and put it in Panaya's mouth. An owl called out a warning to her and awoke her. She ran to the sea where her people drew her down into the depths. Karatoki swam frantically about searching for her. He never saw her again. Today, when some people stand on the cliffs and look deep into the water at the reef, they see Panaya with her arms outstretched, calling to her former lover. And of course, if they don't want to look there, they can go and see the statue in town. <laughs> About 15 miles from Napier is Cape Kidnapper's Gannet Colony. It's a breeding colony for about 3,000 pairs of Australasian gannets. The first European to see the future site of Napier was Captain James Cook on HMS Endeavour in 1769. The Cape was named after an attempt by local Maoris to kidnap a member of Cook's crew. 
His journal stated that the crew member was in the water near the ship when the Maori fishermen dragged, tried to drag him aboard their canoe. Sailors on the Endeavor deck opened fire on the native boat. They killed two Maori and wounded a third, but saved the crewmen. Napier was subsequently visited and later settled by European traders, whalers, and missionaries. Less than 100 years after Cook's visit, farmers had arrived and hotel keepers began to set up shop. In 1931, most of Napier and the nearby town of Hastings were leveled by earthquakes. About 15 square miles of today's Napier were underwater before that earthquake, but the quake raised it above the sea. The Museum Theater Gallery here has an excellent exhibit on the earthquake, its causes, and its impact. Historic Napier Prison is the oldest prison in New Zealand, and visitors can learn about its history as well as see evidence from the earthquake. Basically, it's the only place in Napier where some of the damage has been left in place so people can see it. There's a few Art Deco buildings in town that have been replaced, but most of Napier's town, central town center remains intact, and it's been nominated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's renowned for these uh, really beautiful Art Deco buildings and its old, old cars. Now let's set our virtual sails, and we're going to go to the next port, which is up at Taronga. It was settled by the Maori late in the 13th century and by Europeans 600 years later, but it wasn't chartered as a city until 1963. Today it has a population of about 130,000 people. Taranga is the most popular city on the Bay of Plenty, uh, and it's known simply as the Mount. Uh, nearby the beach has an extinct volcanic cone that rises above the town. In history, it was a Maori fortress, and the remains of trenches can still be seen on the ridges of that volcano. According to the Maori legend, that hill was a slave to another mountain that was nearby. Taranga has very beautiful scenery and numerous parks. Nearby is Rotorua with its hot springs and geysers. Now, throughout the area, if you're not into sulfur, you're going to smell it. It has a very strong sulfur smell all around Rotorua and even sometimes into Taranga. Uh, the name Rotorua is a Maori phrase that means second lake. A native chief discovered the lake that was the largest of those northeast of the city, and the water bodies are all connected together through this caldera system. Rotorua Museum of Art and History is a local museum and gallery, and the museum opened in 1969. It's basically an old bathhouse building in the government gardens. House collections include fine art, photography, social history, and objects from Maori culture. The indigenous people were hunters and gatherers, crop farmers who harvested food from the forest, streams, the sea, and the gardens. The traditional diet was based on birds and fish supplemented by wild herbs and roots. And in Taranga and Rotura, uh, you can try some Maori dishes. They kind of look like that when they're served. And, of course, you have fresh vegetables and some fish and some chicken. Uh, kai is a Maori word for food that's usually cooked in an earthen oven. And in tribal gardens, the Maori also grew things like potato and kumara, or sweet potatoes. The first European to the Tangarella area was probably a trader from the Bay of Plenty back in 1828. Uh, three years later, a mission was established, but that was abandoned within a year. Then in 1840, Catholic missionaries visited Taranga to get some potatoes, pigs, and flax. A bishop was given land, and he established a church and a presbytery. That mission closed in 1864 because of wars between the local native people. Now it's on to Auckland, uh, our final port of call in New Zealand. With a population of over 1.4 million people, this city is home to nearly one-third of the country's entire population. In 2013, it was declared the city with the third best quality of life in the world, just behind Vienna, Austria, and Zurich, Switzerland. Pretty good company, if you ask me. The Auckland Isthmus, with its rich and fertile land, was settled by the Maori around 1350. After the signing of the treaty by Governor Hobson and the Maori chiefs, one of the chieftains gave him property as a sign of goodwill. 
Auckland was initially chosen to be the new capital, but in 1840, Port Nicholson, later known as Wellington, became the capital of New Zealand. And it was seen at the time that it was a better choice because it was closer in proximity to South Island. It was just across the strait. Overlooking Auckland is Mount Eden. It's the highest in the region's volcanoes that were formed about 25,000 years ago. The mountain was a pa, or a fortress, uh, used by various Maori tribes. And actually, you can just barely make them out in this picture, but you can see the earthen walls and ramparts and terraces that give the distinctive outline to the hill itself. The Europeans cleared the land of rocks, and they used those rocks to build fences for property lines. Now, the result of that was a landscape that somewhat looks like the Ireland or the Scottish lowlands. So you have these little farms that are all outlined with rock. Initially, the Mount Eden area was farmland, but soon the landscape was dotted with country residents for professionals and business people of Auckland. There are a lot of things to do in Auckland. This city is kind of a real metropolis of, of great places to go. The New Zealand Maritime Museum is located on Hobson Wharf, not too far uh, from where the cruise terminal is. It's easy walk. Uh, its exhibits span the New Zealand's maritime history from the first Polynesian explorers to, America, to the America's Cup itself. Uh, in addition to several reconstructed or preserved ships that are inside the museum, they also have a large number of vessels that are berthed outside. There's an excellent aquarium in Auckland called the Kelly Tartan Sea Life Aquarium. It has these acrylic tunnels where you can walk through underneath this tanks full of fish. About 2,000 fish will be swimming above you. It also has a moving walkway, so if you don't want to walk, you can just stand there and it'll take you through. Uh, there are penguins to see, and there's even a recreated uh, hut that was left from the Antarctic explorations back in 1912. Now, if you really feel adventurous, you can suit up for a fee and swim with the sharks <laughs> at feeding time. <laughs> for a great overview of Auckland, a trip up the Sky Tower is pretty much considered a must-do. Sky Tower is an observation and telecommunications tower. It's located on the corner of Victoria and Federal Streets in the Auckland Central Business District. It's 328 meters, or a little over 1,000 feet high and it's the tallest man-made structure in the Southern Hemisphere. It's pretty much become an iconic landmark of Auckland's skyline because of its height and unique design. I mean, it sticks up higher than anything else, so it's kind of hard not to see it. Now, for the really, really adventurous at the tower, there's a thing called the sky jump. <laughs> That's a 192 meter, or about a 630 foot jump off the observation deck. During that jump, you can get to speeds maybe of 85 kilometers an hour or about 53 miles an hour. And that jump is a cable-guided controlled jump to keep people from slamming into the tower in case of strong winds. OK, you're not into jumping. I understand that. But you still want to have a little bit of an adrenaline rush. You can actually go out and walk around the outside of the tower 1,000 feet above the ground. Doesn't that sound like fun? Let me know how you enjoy it. <laughs> the Auckland Civic Center is as significant as one of only seven of its kind that remain in the world. It was its first purpose-built. Uh, it was the first purpose-built cinema in New Zealand. Now, inside, it's kind of interesting because it has an Indian-inspired foyer that has seated Buddhas and twisted columns and dome ceilings. The main auditorium itself imitates a Moorish garden and it has turrets and minarets and spires and tiled roofs. There are also several famous Abyssinian panther statues that are in the building. Now, the large theater seats about 2,300 people, first opened back in 1929 with its atmospheric style. It has lights and a design that conveys the feeling of being outdoors, even though you're inside the theater at night. The illusion of the sky really comes from complete little stars that twinkle in the ceiling when you're in there at night. Speaking of stars, how many people want to see the Southern Cross? A lot of people that came from the north want to see it. Well, you might have some problems if the weather doesn't cooperate, but a lot of people who come here want to see it uh, because it's pretty well known. Now, Southern Cross or Cruce is a cross-shaped pattern of stars. I added the little dotted lines to help people identify it. 
Anyway, it's the smallest and dimmest, yet one of the most significant of the 88 modern constellations of stars. The Southern Cross has great significance to the cultures in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly in New Zealand and Australia. There, people refer to themselves as sons and daughters of the Southern Cross. Now, the Southern Cross was not defined or accurately mapped until well into the 16th century. Alpha Crucis, down there, is the brightest and the bottom star of the cross. The next two in brightness are the Mimosa and the Gamma, while the Delta and the Epsilon make up the rest of the pattern. Now, I'm going to have a quiz on this later on, so no, no, just kidding, just kidding. Since the colonial age, the crux has been used as a national symbol by several nations. The brightest stars on the Southern Cross appear on the flags of Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, Papua New Guinea, and Samoa. Well, that's it for today. So please join me out in Baristas. We'll have a cup of coffee, have a chance to sit. We can talk about New Zealand or any place else that we're going to visit during our cruise. Have a cup of coffee, chat about this or anything else you want to talk about. And again, this will repeat on Channel 9 on your local television and check your currents for the next of my presentations. Thank you very much. Have a great remains of the day.